Welcome to part two of our look at Tenra Boncho Zero. This is where we get into the meat of the matter and how it plays. Since this is a bigger book than the previous part, I hope you brought some popcorn or took a break during the intermission. Let's get started. The mechanics book is entirely black and white with a generous amount of art, as well as several forcoma like manga pages explaining mechanics in the game, much like in the setting book, which I thought was a nice touch. While I'm not entirely fond of the chapter flow, there was rarely anything that came off as obscure or out of place in the layout. That said, I'm not sure if it's an entirely good idea to use a smaller page size for this instead of the standard A4 size. On one hand, this is closer to the original publishing style, no doubt. But on the other hand, I can see this as a potential problem if frequent lookup is involved or for people who have a harder time with small text. That said, this is less of a problem with the digital release of the game, obviously. The first few pages amount to the usual, what is this book, and what is an RPG, segments that are easily skimmed over, but to its credit, it's written here with a more newbie-friendly tone, including the introduction of concept sidebars which explain the mindset of a specific rule throughout the book. Also, it acknowledges that someone coming into the book may have more of a background in computer RPGs than tabletop ones, a move that I approve of. Finally, there's a lexicon on the mechanical terms, similar to the introductory lexicon in an Exalted or World of Darkness book. This will not be the last time I make comparisons to White Wolf games, I assure you. Chapter 1 is a rundown of character creation. While the first parts reference the sample characters included in the book, for now I'll be focusing on the creation mechanics and get to the sample characters when they come. The first step is to choose an archetype or multiple archetypes. You may select as many archetypes as you like, but the more archetypes you choose, that will add to a higher karma total. In this game, karma represents your attachment to worldly aspects. In character creation, the total karma must be less than 108. If your karma reaches that level or higher, they will become an NPC known as an Asura. Managing karma is a trade-off. Starting with high karma will grant you many abilities and effects to work with, but at the cost of being unable to utilize some of the more dramatic feats that lower karma characters have. Step 2 is to assign attribute points. A starting character has 40 points to spend among the 7 primary attributes, which are as follows. Body, Agility, Senses, Knowledge, Spirit, Empathy, and Station. The spending range of each attribute is a minimum of 1 and a maximum of 10. It is important to note that you may start with less points if one of your ar archetypes has an attribute cost, or if you opt to trade attribute points for ranks and general skills. From these, there are three derived attributes that are calculated. The first is your vitality, which is your ability to withstand physical punishment. The second is your soul, which determines your ability to withstand mental stress, as well as your MP of sorts. Finally comes your wound track, which determines the serious injuries that you can withstand before death. The final step is your character's fates. Fates will be explained in more detail later, but for now you'll have to look at the fates listed in your archetype or archetypes and pick two of them. One of those two will be rated at 3 on your character sheet and the other at 2. You should also note any special conditions if they're applicable. The remaining sections in this chapter detail some of the special rules of certain character archetypes, such as the means which a Mekio mirror is used by the Shinto priesthood and by armor riders. Many of said archetypes are reminiscent of the character Metatypes in Exalted, in which each of the aforementioned archetypes had a unique ex mechanic exclusive to them. Finally, the chapter ends with a step-by-step -step example of character creation, which goes into great detail on how it works, even including a completed character sheet. Chapter 2 covers the core mechanics. Much like Shadowrun, TBZ uses a d6-based die pool based on an attribute skill formula of his successes versus a target number. Where this formula differs in TBZ is the means in determining successes. Instead of the skill being added to the total die pool, skills determine the number you have to roll under for a given die to count as a success. Following an explanation on the die mechanic comes how equipment maintenance works, or rather the lack of mechanics surrounding it. TBZ is a dramatic narrative game, and as such there is little in the way of mechanics for broken equipment or durability. It's something that only matters when it serves the story one way or another. This also applies to the currency you may or may not have. However, there is detail given on specialized equipment found. Said equipment is usually the kind of thing that would come with an attribute or karma cost at character creation, and as such requires a cost in Kiai in-game. More on that later. Otherwise, it is lost at the end of a scenario. The final segment in Chapter 2 is the skill list. 
Skills operate on a ranking of 0 to 5 and are separated into general and specialist skills. General skills are the sort of skills that an average layperson is expected to have some capacity with and as such automatically have a rating of 1. On the other side of the coin are specialist skills which require more specific training or are related to a certain background. These skills will start with a rating of 2 when they are acquired. Finally, skills are not intrinsically linked to a specific attribute, and this section gives examples of skills with different attributes as well as some of their unique effects. Chapter 3 details the karma system in the game's mechanics. As I established before, a character's karma must be less than 108 at any given time, otherwise they become an NPC. The implication is that excessive karma doesn't make you a monster per se, but rather someone who cares so much about something that you will go to harmful lengths for the sake of that care. The mechanics of the karma system in TBZ are separated into four concepts which link into each other. Aiki, Kiai, the aforementioned karma, and fate. Ki amounts to a character's extra effort mechanic in TBZ. As such, it may be spent to enhance a given action, but it also acts as a kind of experience points that can be used to develop skills or gain new equipment. Ki spent will be added to the karma score at the end of a scene. Aiki can be best summed up as audience applause, and is granted by the GM or the other players for good role-playing. A loose comparison could be made to the stunt dice in Exalted, wherein a good description of an action is rewarded with an extra die. TBZ makes frequent reference in this mechanic to Kabuki Theater and how the crowd is just as much a part of the action as the actors on stage are, rallying behind certain moments in dramatic scenes, or hollering alongside the dramatic moments inside a play. Awarded Aiki points, or chits, do nothing on their own, but they can be converted into ki points that do not generate karma when used. Or they may be used to, dram to add a dramatic monkey wrench into a given situation. Finally, fate represents the ideas, beliefs, and concepts that a character cares about. Acting out one's fate is a potential means to gain i key during play, as well as mitigate one's karma. Fates are ranked at 2 to 5 on the same scale as skills, but each fate has a point cost that cannot exceed the character's karma total. Between major scenes in a given scenario, a player may alter, gain, or reduce their fates, the latter being the primary way karma is lost in the game. This mechanic is referred to as Antaman, or no cell. Additionally, fate produces a starting key eye pool based on the results of an empathy and fate roll. The final section details the relationship karma has with the Mekio soul mirrors. Mekio with high karma provide a bonus to attributes and abilities with the machine they are bonded with. However, the total karma of a soul mirror and the character interfacing it cannot exceed 108. Otherwise, the mirror will reject that person and the interface will shut down. Kimenkyo, the mass-produced variant, does not have this drawback, but cannot gain the karma bonuses that Mekio has. Chapter 4 details the combat system. Instead of making a roll to determine relative turn order, here turn order is determined solely by agility. Only one action may be performed each round as opposed to a set of ranked actions, presumably to keep things moving from character to character in the story. On the other hand, in TBZ, defending does not count as an action, but you may only defend with one roll per attack. TBZ does not have a defense attribute, and thus any given attack is an opposed roll or an evasion roll. If you gain more successes from your opponent, you deal damage equal to the difference plus the modifier from your weapon. Conversely, less successes allows your opponent to counterattack, calculating damage in a similar manner if he or she wishes to do so. Obviously, defending against something like the marksman skill attack does not grant a counterattack, nor does using evasion for defense. After damage is calculated, it is then subtracted from either vitality, wounds, or a combination of the two by the character who received the damage. Vitality in this case is superficial damage. Cuts, bruises, etc. While wounds are more serious or even grievous in injuries. Mechanically, suffering a wound will grant a die bonus to all rolls, but a heavier wound will slowly drain vitality each round. In addition, wounds take longer to recover from than lost vitality. Conceptually, this is based on the concept of characters drawing from the inner reserves and a will to win despite the damage they suffered as seen in various media like anime and samurai films. Following this is an entry on how damage is healed, as well as special abilities that may accelerate the healing process, such as the Buddha spell Iyashi or Rejuvenation Worm for an analyst. The final section is on special combat rules that may be utilized. Among these things are the simultaneous strike, which allows an opponent to roll all successes in an attack to grant a character to do the same. Damage bonuses for ranged weapons, sneak attacks, and the combat mechanics for certain archetypes such as the Samurai's Transformation or the Kungoki's Overdrive Power are detailed here. 
Chapter 5 details the Zero System, and acts as a kind of GM section for TBZ. While much of the advice is on preparation and follow-through, a significant amount of it is dedicated to the flow of a scenario in acts and scenes, making frequent references to the way a play is structured. Also included are things like where to sit and the importance of bringing dice, snacks, and writing utensils. Things like this are common knowledge, to be sure, but having them written here helps to add an atmosphere of being written for newbie players just as much as for old hats at the hobby. Chapter 6 focuses on the so-called Zero Act, as well as the Emotion Matrix mechanics. Generally speaking, this chapter deals with elements that take place before and after the action of the play. Four mechanics are detailed here. The Zero Act, Destinies, the Emotion Matrix, and the Moment of Truth. The Zero Act can be thought of as the overture of the scenario. Here the mood and imagery is set for the coming game, as well as introducing the character actors into the scene and their destinies concerning it. Destinies are a special kind of fate mechanic that is tied specifically to the scenario in play. While they work mechanically like a character's fate, and will usually take the form of a goal, mission, or motivation, it is strongly implied that said destiny must happen in some form during the story, as a personal victory in that it may or may not conflict with the goals of the others. The Emotion Matrix details how a player character feels about other characters upon first meeting them. This is typically made on a 2d6 roll on the Emotion Matrix chart, with one die result being the tens and another being the ones. If they are not satisfied with the result, they can spend a key eye to move horizontally or vertically one step along the path, which can be done as many times as one wishes. It is worth noting that the emotion matrix is only the first impression of a character, not the defining opinion they must have on them at all times. The moment of truth is an optional rule that is meant to represent an all-or-nothing action. This action may be declared once in a single game session and only with the permission of the other players. When it is declared, all of the other players may add up to or all of their IQ chits into a pool that is given to the declaring player. This pool of chits is used to make one final fate roll that spends all of them to generate key eye points as normal. Additionally, any key eye points that are unspent from each player may be converted back into I key to be added to the aforementioned pool. As I said before, this concept is based on an all or nothing final attack, typically against the dramatic big bad of that session. Chapter 7 details scenario creation. The battle cry when it comes to how one makes a given adventure more Tenra-esque is in three parts. Present a problem, present dramatic situations, and present fast pacing. Much of this chapter is GM advice on creating an ideal scenario, including the recommended use of destiny and keeping your dramatic tone. While it is tempting to skim over parts like this, I would recommend otherwise since it goes into great detail on the theatrical style of the game. Additionally, I have to give the game props for presenting the fail forward concept that fail does not necessarily mean the flow has stopped, but provides opportunities for drama on its own. Chapter 8 is referred to as the character rulebook, and focuses on the specific mechanics of several archetypes that have been hinted at in previous parts of the book, as well as in the setting book in general. As such, I will not refer to each as an individual chapter, but rather as a section for each rule set in the archetype, much like I did for the setting book. Section 1 is on the mechanics of armor. Following a reintroduction to the mechanics of Mechio Soul Mayors concerning armor, the section then delves into armor creation rules. In some ways, it is similar to character creation with a few specific steps. 1. Armor archetypes, or frames, do not have a karma cost. Instead, you must have a specific amount of station to acquire and or use one. 2. Armors only have three attributes which supersede the pilots when in use. Body, agility, and senses. The amount of points it receives to spend in each attribute is dependent on the choice of frame, each to a minimum of three before modifiers. 3. Each piece of equipment adds to the total karma with a set of available slots based on the choice of head, upper torso, and arms, as well as the lower torso and legs. The remainder of this section contains the armor-specific weapons, as well as a few example armors. Section 2 concerns Omyo Jutsu. This section contains rules on both summoning Shikigami, as well as the creation of Shikigami themselves. Shiki are created on a set of points based on the summoner's knowledge, multiplied by his Omyo Jutsu skill level. Half of this creation point cost determines the soul point cost for summoning the Shiki. Furthermore, the total points in creation determines the scores it has for using attributes, skills, and vitality. There are two methods to creating Shiki, random and crafted. In random, the choice of abilities to spend creation points on the Shiki is determined by die rolls on the ability chart. Two dice are rolled to determine the ability and one more to determine the ability's level and point cost. The main advantage with the random method is that you can exceed the creation point cost since you must roll until you have no points left, even if it's just one. However, random creation has a chance of the Shiki going out of control, so it is a double-edged sword. 
Crafting is a more focused approach. While it's useful for making a utility belt of Shiki, the drawback is that in addition to having a lower skill rating, the creation point total becomes an uncrossable line. The crafting method is also instrumental to making talismans, which are Shiki bound to a physical object which anyone can use. As mentioned in the setting book, there are three methods one can use to summon a Shiki. The first is the normal method with ink and prayer strips. The second is through a talisman, as I've discussed before. And the third is known as Shiki slinging. The difference between the three is how long it takes for the Shiki to be summoned, take form, and act. While slinging is the fastest method, it is also the most dangerous as a failed summoning roll causes the Shiki to go out of control. The remaining parts of this section cover the creation of talismans, using a Kimenkyo instead of a Mekyo in summoning, and finally the Shiki ability list along with a few examples Shikigami. Section 3 covers Samurai. The method of crafting the Shiki for Samuraization Surgery is identical to the Shiki creation for Omyo Jutsu, and half of the creation points used in it determines the soul point cost whenever the Samurai transforms. The main difference is that abilities for that Shiki cannot change after the surgery. The only way to change that for the Samurai is to have that Shiki removed and be replaced with a new one. Also, infusing soul gems into the Samurai's body during the surgery process allows them to utilize their transformation at a lower point cost. At the end of the section is a set of loadout examples for samurai characters. Section 4 covers Buddhist magic, a more traditional spell approach, though more akin to clerics than anything else. This section also delves into the martial arts sects in Tenra, called the 108 Factions of the Lords of Light, collectively, and acts similar to the Art of War skills we'll get into later. Section 5 covers Kijin and Mechanica. Normally, the Kijin process is accounted for by the player taking the archetype at creation, but it may also occur after the fact. In that case, the cost for the modification is in Kiai equal to 10 times the attribute cost. The remainder of the section deals with the various types of Mechanica available, categorized by the part of the body they'd graft onto or replace. Section 6 covers Kongoki. Mechanically, Kongoki act very much like armor, but have a few key differences. First, Kongoki cannot use armor parts or frames, but they have their own frames and utilize normal weapons. Second, Kongoki possess an ability known as Overdrive, which can be used to make any successes on a physical roll be re-rolled once more for an additional success each die. Third, because of the means of their creation, Kongoki start with the Sealed Memories fate, which will trigger flashbacks based on the amount of Aiki that you acquire in a given campaign. Section 7 covers ninjutsu, which is slightly similar to Buddhist magic mechanically but with a few wrinkles. 1. After the expenditure of soul, you must make an agility ninjutsu roll against the technique's difficulty. Extra successes may be banked to be used for the technique's effect. 2. Many of the arts will require special equipment, listed in their entries. 3. A shinobi's dark arts rating will reduce the soul cost of their arts to a minimum of 1. 4. Certain techniques will be classified as ninpo. These require a rating in 5 in ninjutsu to learn. Additionally, each of the ninjutsu schools will have two associated skills as paths. These skills may be substituted for ninjutsu in relevant roles. Section 7 covers the Butterfly Dream ability for the Kugutsu. Aside from it using the Empathy attribute along with either the Performance or Pillow Art skills, the Dream is mechanically vague. Its events are played out as a kind of sub-scene involving the Kugutsu and its target or targets, with the targets usually forgetting its events aside from an emotional resonance after the fact. Section 8 covers Annelids. Characters with the Worm Charm skill may implant Annelids into others or into themselves, but implanting one costs a certain amount of karma depending on the Annelid in question. Unlike the other transformation-based archetype, the Samurai, activating an Annelid does not cost soul. It is activated immediately when it is declared unless otherwise noted. Section 9 covers Resonance, the psychic powers of the Oni. Resonance has levels like a skill, but this merely determines the maximum effect and soul cost that can be used by an Oni. Additionally, there are a few special Resonance abilities that can only be used by full-blooded Oni, which half Oni cannot use. Section 10 covers the abilities available to Shinto priests. Unlike other abilities, the Shinto skill level is the character's rank amongst the priesthood. Mechanically, this is a factor when using effects labeled Forbidden Arts in this section. Section 11 covers Ayakashi. As discussed in the setting book, Ayakashi is a catch-all for creating the non-human spirits and creatures of Tenra. Things like the classical Nue, Kappa, and the Yuki Ona would be classified as Ayakashi in game terms. Ayakashi creation is probably the most involved of these sections. The first step in creating an Ayakashi is choosing its species, 
which determines the amount of generation points it will have available. Second comes attributes, which are spent on levels of 10 generation points. Sub-attributes are generated in the same way as player characters. Third is the choice of Yojutsu, Ayakashi powers, as well as their skills. Both have the same cost for each level, but Yojutsu are treated as skills for the purpose of die rolling. After that comes special weaknesses, such as taboos and vulnerabilities. The assigned level of either grants extra generation points depending on said level. Mechanically, taboos are things that an Ayakashi cannot do and determines the damage they suffer if they perform that action, while vulnerabilities are things that can cause greater and almost irreparable harm to an Ayakashi and are difficult to heal. The final step is an Ayakashi's goals. Goals are the defining motivations of an Ayakashi and are harder to stray from the greater rank the goal is to the point where their existence may depend on pursuing said goal at all costs. The final section covers the arts of war, the martial arts styles of Tenra. While the arts have ranks like a skill, it is used to show mastery in the particular style of martial art as well as the techniques available to that character from it. The techniques themselves are utilized with the relevant skill of that art, which is detailed in its description. Chapter 9 is a sample playset, an example region of Tenra. The world itself is painted in broad strokes, much like in the setting book, with little in the way of a specific map that covers every town or region. This chapter provides one example region with a myriad of locales and factions to serve as a story seed for campaigns. Written in a manner that's more accessible for inexperienced players or ones who aren't familiar with the classical Japanese style that the game is going for. Finally, we come to the appendix, which covers a glossary of turns for TBZ, several media resources from the game ranging from movies to manga to video games, and several sections of game advice for new players. More importantly, however, is that the appendix covers the full archetype list for characters as well as a system for creating new archetypes. The appendix also details the available weapons along with a system to create new weapons for characters. The book ends with a few sample characters, a more detailed emotion matrix, and an index. In my view, while both books have a lot of info ripe for picking, mastery the whole of both of them isn't necessary. The majority of the mechanics book is on optional or character-specific rules and reference materials. Only the first few chapters are truly necessary to grasp the mechanics. This is the first book I've reviewed where the setting is part of the selling point, and it has a lot of material ripe for picking, especially if you like your stories more dramatic than realistic. It's written in a manner that is very accessible to rookies and old hats alike, as I've said before, and it has some damn fine artwork to illustrate its world. It also shows its creative voice in each page, which is something I wholeheartedly approve of. And I may come off offensive when I say something like this, but this is probably the most Japanese game I'll ever review, in the sense of the traditions it's drawing from. Classic folklore, period dramas, kabuki theater, as well as modern anime and a bit of the cyberpunk wave of the 1990s. On the other hand, I'm not entirely fond of the chapter format in some parts, specifically having the archetype and equipment list and the appendix near the back. However, the mechanic that will be the make or break for people is karma. I can picture a lot of people not happy with how easy advancements can put you closer to losing the character you worked so hard to make. Personally, I think the flaw with Karma is that it is more suited to single scenario plays than longer story arcs. Or, to use a TV analogy, it's better for episodes than for seasons. In addition, several of the archetype abilities use a point-buy system, namely Shiki and Ayakashi creation, and suffer the main flaw of point-buy systems as a result. The math of plus and minus can make it potentially easy to game the system, and requires a more careful watch by the GM. In spite of this, the game maintains a strong creative voice, and I can highly recommend it to fans of anime and dramatic role-playing, especially those who are fans of the exalted setting, but not so much the exalted rules. Therefore, I give Tenra Bancho Zero a 7 out of 10. I'll be taking a break for the rest of the month, but I'll have two major reviews coming up for you next month. The first one will be Haven, City of Violence by Lewis Porter Jr. Games. As for the latter one, it'll be finally time to discuss the big one, because late this December we're delving into Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. This will not end well. But that said, this is Mildred the Monk saying keep rolling those 20s, stay frosty everybody.